This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 19. Coming up on Space Time, a spectacular launch for Crew Dragon 2. The Curiosity rover suffers a computer glitch and NASA's new Martian weather station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA and SpaceX have successfully launched the Crew Dragon 2 capsule on its historic first demonstration flight to the International Space Station. The Demo-1 mission will herald America's return to launching people into orbit from American soil. That's something which hasn't happened since the mothballing of the space shuttle fleet in July 2011 with the return to Earth of Atlantis on STS-135. The mission blasted off aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. That's the same launch pad which sent Apollo 11 to the moon 50 years ago and which also launched the last ever space shuttle mission almost eight years ago. Stage one, pressing for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. Vehicle is pitching down range. Stage one throttle nominal. Stage one throttle bucket. Power and telemetry nominal. The Falcon 9 rocket as it ascends through the atmosphere carrying the SpaceX Dragon 2 capsule to vehicle orbit. Is the vehicle just passed through max Q, which is the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. As you can hear in the background, the excitement at SpaceX headquarters is unbelievable here. Stage one throttle vehicle is passing through max Q. You heard that call out from max Q on the nets. Uh, the Falcon 9 actually throttles down its nine Merlin engines to reduce aerodynamic loads on the vehicle. Uh, it is now throttling those engines back up. Coming up at T plus two minutes and 35 seconds is going to be three Invective events kill. in quick succession. The first one is going to be the main engine cutoff, or MECO. That's when the nine Merlin 1D engine will cut off shortly before a stage separation at two minutes and 38 seconds. Shortly after that, the Merlin vacuum engine on the bottom of the second stage of the Falcon 9 will ignite in what we call second engine start, or SES. That will be at 2 minutes and 46 seconds. As you can hear from the cheering here at SpaceX headquarters, uh, we did have a successful main engine cut off, a stage separation. That second, second stage engine is currently started and accelerating Dragon towards orbit. First stage as it makes its way back down towards the Earth. Let's go down to Lauren and Dan for updates on that first stage recovery. We're gonna execute two burns before landing on the drone ship. The first is the entry burn start, which is starting at T plus seven minutes and 48 seconds approximately. Uh, that's where three of the M1D engines will reignite. And what that burn does is it slows down stage one as it re-enters the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. If we didn't do that, that aerodynamic re-entry heating, the aero heating would heat up stage one and it would potentially break it apart. So we got to slow it down. From there, it, stage one is going to coast its way back down using those grid fins to help steer it. And then it'll execute the landing burn. That's going to happen at T plus nine minutes and 24 seconds. That's where we're going to reignite that center E9 engine to hopefully bring stage one down to a beautiful stop right on the drone ship. That's right, and while all that's happening, the second stage glowing bright here, continuing to power Dragon. It's gonna continue burning until just about nine minutes after launch. Down to a single engine, but that one providing a little over 200,000 pounds of thrust to carry Dragon through the upper parts of Earth's atmosphere. Not as much resistance to fight against once you're up this high and it's gonna get Dragon into that initial orbit, and it's still gonna be a couple hundred kilometers beneath the station, and then it'll be turned over to thrusters on Dragon once it separates from that second stage to then begin the chase down of the orbiting laboratory. But all the calls so far indicating nominal performance. Okay, we're hearing that MVAC is performing nominally. It's looking good on power. Temperatures are good. Stage one continues to come back nominally, and the trajectory continues to be nominal on stage two. Second stage burn continues to burn nominally. Stage one, FTS is safe. Stage one, entry burn has started. So three M1D engines reigniting. Burn is going to continue on for about another eight 
15 or so seconds. So a little back-to-back -back action now as we see stage one coming back down towards Earth, stage two still making its way up into outer space. The dragon still nestled on top, getting ready. Stage one, entry baron yeah. shutdown. And there's the end of that stage one stage shutdown. Two, okay, so stage one is going to continue to coast its way down using those grid fins for attitude control and steering. Invex throttling now for Seco. Stage one is trained. And we have had a successful shutdown. Invex. At the start of that burn, stage one will be traveling at 275 meters per second. That single engine burn is going to bring that from 275 to zero. We did just hear that stage one landing burn has started. about 500 kilometers away from where it launched from. The vehicle will now undergo its safing procedures, and the recovery team will make sure it's strapped down and it'll make its way back to <laughs> Cape Canaveral. It's Coming up very shortly, in just about 20 seconds here, uh, the Dragon spacecraft is going to be separating from the top of the Falcon 9 rocket. Separation should be occurring around 11 minutes and 5 seconds. Just about now. Let's wait for confirmation. Dragon, separation confirmed. And there it is. Dragon 2 spacecraft flying in space for the first time. If this mission and further tests are successful, a two-person crew will test ride the capsule in July, with Crew Dragon 2 then beginning regular astronaut transfer flights to the International Space Station before the end of the year. This project is vital for ending America's reliance on Russian Soyuz rockets to reach the International Space Station. See, you've got to remember that Moscow were charging space tourists $20 million per seat for the ride to orbit. But they've been charging the U.S. taxpayer between 60 and $80 million for the same journey, a clear indication it's not just the oligarchs who are making money. The Crew Dragon 2's unmanned orbital certification test flight allows engineers to check out all of the new capsule's equipment under actual in-space flight conditions, as part of the process needed to achieve human spaceflight qualification for transporting crew to the space station. These include end-to-end -end tests of all ground and spacecraft systems, including Dragon's avionics, communications, telemetry, environmental and life support, electrical, guidance, navigation, control and propulsion systems. The flight's also monitoring internal and external loads, vibration levels and acoustics. So we're going to have an orbital flight test a test without the crew in it of each vehicle and then we're going to have the first flight with crew in them to prove that these systems are ready to fly people to space. These demonstration missions are important for astronaut safety because you know the folks around here that I work with we all ask ourselves would we be comfortable flying our own family on board this vehicle and the answer has to be yes and so because of that we need to make sure we test these as much as we can. Since we're dealing sort of with a new generation of people who are putting human space vehicles together again, I think it's important to impress upon them every day that there is not a day where their attention can waver. We can test them down here on Earth. Um, we can put them in vacuum chambers and acoustic chambers and, you know, do thermal tests on them. But there's nothing like going up and putting them in the real environment. That will give us a lot of insight on the vehicle performance, the functional systems, uh, even the abort system will be active on that vehicle. So that's why these initial test flights are, are so important is because you need to see it's not just the hardware, it's also the software, it's the people, it's the procedures, it's the whole thing uh, coming together. Boeing's supposed to land on land, SpaceX is supposed to land in water. Those are two hugely different environments, so there's a little bit of interest in the survival equipment that's uh, located in the spacecraft as well, where that's going to be, how that's going to work. This is a really critical aspect of the NASA job, is to continue to have that dialogue with the contractors about, well, why did you do that? You know, why was that safer? This is someone's family member, husband, wife, uncle, aunt. It's not an option to not be successful. We have to be successful. There you heard the voices of Victor Glover, a NASA astronaut who will be on the first SpaceX operational mission, Abhi Tripathi, SpaceX Commercial Crew Certification Director, Chris Ferguson, a Boeing astronaut who will be on the Boeing crew flight test, Michael Good from NASA's Management Astronaut Crew Operations and Testing, 
Kevin Vega, a NASA launch vehicle engineer, Mike Hopkins, the other NASA astronaut who'll be on SpaceX's first operational mission, Sunny Williams, a NASA astronaut who'll be on Boeing's first operational mission, Kathy Luders, who's NASA's commercial crew program manager, and Brittany Sims, a NASA certification systems engineer. Evaluations of the new space capsule are being aided by Ripley, a spacesuit-clad sensor-laden anthropomorphic test dummy which is flying the mission. Named after the lead character in the Alien movie franchise, Ripley is another Starman-type test mannequin, just like the one which flew aboard SpaceX's Falcon Heavy test flight a year ago, seated in Elon Musk's little red sports car. And yes, I know that last week we called Starman Mannequin Skywalker. My apologies for that. Mannequin Skywalker, of course, is the sensor-laden test dummy who flew aboard Blue Origin's new Shepard capsule. It's hard to keep up sometimes, especially during Mardi Gras week. Unlike the current Dragon capsule, which is manually berthed to the space station after being grappled by the orbiting outpost's robotic arm, Crew Dragon 2 docks autonomously to the Harmony module's international docking adapter. If all goes to plan, Dragon 2 will undock from the space station on March the 8th. It'll then deorbit and conduct a full re-entry sequence, splashing down about six hours later in the North Atlantic Ocean, around 370 kilometres east of Cape Canaveral. Crew Dragon 2 is an advanced, updated version of SpaceX's current reusable Dragon capsule, which has now flown 16 robotic resupply missions to the space station. The new capsule has been under development since 2014 as part of NASA's commercial crew program to use contractors to fly crew to the space station. The new capsule uses an updated outer moulding and is equipped with new flight computers and avionics, a life support system, room for up to seven crew, and windows for them to look out of. And instead of massive banks of controls, dials, switches and monitors, pilots can take control and fly the spacecraft using a touchscreen console. The original Dragon cargo ship used 18 Draco hypergolic liquid fuel thrusters using a storable propellant mixture of monomethylhydrazine fuel and nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer. The Draco engines combined the functions of both main propulsive thrusters and reaction control system for attitude control and manoeuvring. As well as using 16 of the Draco thrusters, Crew Dragon 2 will also use 8 Super Draco rocket engines fitted in pairs in 4 side-mounted thruster pods. Each Super Draco thruster is some 200 times larger and more powerful than the Draco RCS thrusters. The Super Dracos will be used to provide the escape system to fly the capsule out of harm's way during a launch or ascent emergency. They'll also be used for orbital propulsion, manoeuvring, and originally they were also intended for propulsive landings, just like the Falcon 9 rockets, although that's now been put on the back burner in favour of parachute splashdowns at sea. Unlike the current Dragon cargo ships, which use deployable solar arrays that are extended once in orbit, Crew Dragon 2 uses solar panels mounted directly on the sides of the service module hull. The service module, which is called the trunk by SpaceX, also houses auxiliary equipment and heat removal radiators, and it provides aerodynamic stability during emergency aborts. The new spacecraft also uses a movable blast shield, providing a more precise attitude control of the spacecraft during the atmospheric entry phase of return to Earth. As well as Crew Dragon 2, there'll also be a new Cargo Dragon 2 variant, which will be capable of carrying some 3,307 kilograms of supplies, and will eventually replace the current Dragon cargo ships in use. Now, for this mission, space station managers are taking the opportunity to load Crew Dragon 2 with 180 kilograms of additional supplies and equipment for the crew aboard the orbiting outpost. Although Crew Dragon 2 is designed to be reusable, just like the existing Dragon capsule and Falcon 9 launch vehicle, NASA's current SpaceX commercial crew contract calls for the company to only use new capsules and rockets on each astronaut transfer flight. By comparison, Boeing's current NASA commercial crew contract will allow for the reuse of its new crew transfer vehicle, the CST-100 Starliner, which will return to Earth Soyuz style, coming down on dry land. Starliner is slated to conduct an abort test in May and could undertake its first manned space flight in August. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's Mars Curiosity rover is working again following a sudden glitch last week. The issue triggered a backup program which placed the car-sized six-wheel rover into a protective safe mode. Mission managers encountered the problem during a regular boot-up. They say the rover is now operating normally, having successfully booted up over 30 times without further issues. 
Throughout the weekend, Curiosity was sending and receiving technical data, communicating with the team in order to help them pinpoint the cause of the issue. Curiosity Deputy Project Manager Stephen Lee from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the rover experienced a one-time computer reset, but it's been operating normally ever since, which is a good sign. He's still not sure of its exact cause, and so is continuing to gather relevant data for analysis. Mission managers are currently working to take a snapshot of its memory to better understand what might have happened. Meanwhile, science operations will remain on hold until the issue is better understood. In the short term, NASA are limiting commands to the vehicle in order to minimise any changes to its memory. That's because they don't want to destroy any of the evidence that might have caused the computer reset. The issue happened after Curiosity departed Vera Rubin Ridge, where it's been studying local geological formations for more than a year to better understand its history. While there have been a number of clues so far, none fully explains why this ridge has resisted erosion compared to all the bedrock around it. But the rover's investigations did find that the rocks of the ridge formed as sediments settled in an ancient lake, similar to rock layers below the ridge. Interestingly, a NASA orbiter studying Vera Rubin Ridge had previously identified a strong signal for hematite, an iron-rich mineral that often forms in water. Curiosity confirmed the presence of the hematite, along with other signs of ancient water like crystals. These signs appeared in patches, leading scientists to suspect that, over time, groundwater affected some parts of the ridge differently than others. Another discovery was that the hematite signatures which Curiosity mapped didn't always match the view from space. Curiosity's drill also returned to action, only to be stymied by surprisingly hard rocks. Nevertheless, scientists managed to get samples from at least three major rock types in the ridge. The robotic rover will next travel down into a clay-bearing region on the floor of Gale Crater called Glen Torridon. Glen Torridon is in a trough between Vera Rubin Ridge and the rest of Mount Sharp, the central peak of Gale Crater and the primary target of the rover's mission. This region's been called a clay-bearing unit because orbiter data shows that the rocks there contain phyllosilicates, clay minerals that form in water and could tell scientists more about the ancient lakes which were present in Gale Crater off and on throughout its early history. Clay minerals are also known to trap and preserve organic molecules, and the team are already surveying the area for its next drill site. Curiosity has found both clay minerals and organic molecules in many of the rocks it's drilled since landing in 2012. Organic molecules are important because they form the building blocks of life. If both water and organic molecules are present when the rocks formed, this clay-bearing unit may be another example of a habitable environment on ancient Mars the sort of place capable of supporting life, if it ever existed there. Curiosity is now one of two NASA spacecraft on the surface actively studying the red planet at ground level. The other, InSight, is a stationary lander, which touched down on the red planet on November 26th. InSight is now providing daily weather reports from the surface of Mars, including stats on temperature, wind and air pressure. At the moment, the weather at the landing site is fairly typical for this time of year during the late northern Martian winter. There's a high of minus 17 degrees Celsius going down to an overnight minimum of minus 95 degrees, with the wind coming from the southwest at 16.9 metres per second. That data is being supplied by a package of sensors called the Auxiliary Payload Subsystem, which is allowing the lander to provide more round-the-clock weather information than any previous mission to the Martian surface. The lander records this information each second of every Martian day, called a Sol, and then sends it back to Earth on a daily basis. The spacecraft is designed to continue that operation for at least the next two Earth years, allowing it to study seasonal changes in detail. Constantly detecting weather data allows scientists to detect sources of noise which could influence readings from the lander's seismometer and heat flow probe, its two primary science instruments. Both are affected by the red planet's extreme temperature swings. The seismometer is sensitive to air pressure changes and wind, which create movements that could mask actual mass quakes. So, the auxiliary payload subsystem will help scientists filter out environmental noise in the seismic data. The auxiliary payload subsystem includes an air pressure sensor inside the lander and two air temperature and wind sensors on the lander's deck, which are actually refurbished spares originally built for the Curiosity rover. These two east and west facing booms are used to tell scientists when strong winds could interfere with small seismic signals. But they could also be used along with InSight's cameras to study how much dust and sand are being blown around. 
Scientists don't really know how much wind it takes to lift dust in Mars's thin atmosphere, which affects dune formation as well as dust storms, including the planet-encircling dust storm which killed the Opportunity rover last year. InSight's also equipped with the first magnetometer ever placed on the surface of another planet. It's designed to measure changes in the local magnetic field which could influence scientific instruments. The auxiliary payload subsystem will also help scientists learn more about Martian dust devils, which leave long streaks across the red planet's surface. Dust devils are essentially low-pressure whirlwinds, so InSight's air pressure sensor can detect when one's nearby. It's highly sensitive, ten times more so than similar equipment aboard the Viking and Pathfinder landers. This allows it to enable scientists to study dust devils from dozens of metres away. And the early data is already showing scientists that there are a lot of dust storms swirling around InSight's landing site. Meanwhile, InSight has now successfully placed its second instrument on the Martian surface. New images have confirmed that the heat flow and physical properties package was deployed about a metre from InSight's seismometer, which the lander recently covered with a protective shield. This new science package measures heat moving through the Martian subsurface, thereby helping scientists trying to figure out how much energy it takes to build a rocky world. Equipped with a self-hammering spike called the Mole, the instrument will burrow up to 5 metres below the surface, deeper than any other mission of the Red Planet has ever gone. By comparison, NASA's Viking 1 lander could only scoop about 22 centimetres down, and the Phoenix lander, upon which InSight's actually based, scooped down just 18 centimetres. As for the mole itself, well, it's a real feat of engineering, weighing less than a pair of shoes and using less power than a Wi-Fi router, but with the ability to dig down 5 metres below the surface of another planet. A tether connects the instrument support structure to the lander, while a cable attached to the top of the mole is studded with heat sensors to measure the temperature of the Martian subsurface. Heat sensors in the mole itself measure the soil's thermal conductivity, that is, how easily heat moves through the subsurface. And that's why scientists need to get it below ground. Temperature changes on the surface, both from the seasons and the simple day-night cycle, and all that adds unwanted noise to the data. The mole will stop every 50 centimetres and take a thermal conductivity measurement in the soil. Because hammering creates friction and releases heat, the mole will first be allowed to cool down for two days. It will then be heated up by about 10 degrees Celsius over 24 hours. Temperature sensors within the mole measure how rapidly this happens, which then tells scientists the conductivity of the soil. However, if the mole encounters a large rock before reaching a depth of at least 3 metres, scientists will need a full Martian year, that's two Earth years, to filter out all the noise in their data. That's one of the reasons why mission managers carefully selected a landing site with few rocks, and why they spent weeks choosing exactly the right place to install the instrument. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Britain's Weather Bureau, the Met Office, says average global surface temperatures are set to reach around a degree above pre-industrial levels within the next five years. If the observations prove correct, it would make the decade from 2014 to 2023 the warmest run of years since records first began in 1850. Alongside this forecast, 2018 has now been confirmed as nominally the fourth warmest year on record globally at 0.91 plus or minus 0.1 degrees Celsius above the long-term pre-industrial average. It follows 2015, 2016 and 2017, which are the three warmest years in the 169-year record of the data set. The warmth of 2018 is in line with the long-term warming trend driven by the world's emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. And the effects of climate change are not limited to surface temperatures. Warming of the climate system is being seen across a range of climatic indicators, which are building up a picture of global changes occurring across the land, the atmosphere, oceans and ice. A new study has found that nicotine may harm embryos even if you're not the one smoking it. The findings, published in the journal Stem Cell Reports, found exposing embryoid bodies to a growth fluid dosed with nicotine for three weeks killed off cells, caused growth defects, increased levels of damaging molecules, interfered with communications between cells and with normal cell functioning. 
Embryoid bodies are simulated embryos composed of groups of stem cells that give rise to brain, heart, liver, blood vessels, muscles and other organs. The findings suggest that nicotine itself is damaging to embryos, even without the toxins associated with burning tobacco, and it's harmful at every stage of development, even before the embryos adhere to the uterus wall. A new study has found that sporty or bisexual older ladies tend to have more sexual partners over their lifetimes than inactive or straight women. The findings reported in the British Medical Journal also show that gay older men have more lifetime partners than their straight counterparts, and that middle-class men, in terms of income, have fewer partners than either the richest or poorest men. Researchers used data on 3,054 men and 3,867 women aged 50 and above to explore the factors associated with the numbers of sexual partners that older people have. Well, it seems to be fairly obvious, but people who release balloons into the air either to celebrate events or mark someone's death are actually causing huge amounts of death and destruction by killing tons of animals who eat the balloons thinking it's food. A new study by the CSIRO and published in the journal Science Reports has found that balloons are the highest risk plastic debris item found in seabirds, and some 32 times more likely to kill than simply ingesting hard plastics. Researchers looked at the cause of death of 1,733 seabirds from 51 species, finding that one in three of the birds had ingested marine debris. A new study has found that people who believe in conspiracy theories, such as the idea that Princess Diana was murdered by the British establishment, or that the moon landings were a hoax, or that the Earth is flat, are also more likely to accept or engage in everyday criminal activity. The findings reported in the British Journal of Social Psychology are the key results by scientists from the universities of Kent and Staffordshire into the wider impact that conspiracy beliefs can have on behaviour. Scientists found that belief in conspiracy theories, previously associated with prejudice, political disengagement and environmental inaction, also makes people more inclined to actively engage in antisocial behaviour. The study indicated that people who believed in conspiracy theories were also far more accepting of everyday petty crime, such as trying to claim for replacement items, refunds or compensation from stores when they were not entitled to do so. Researchers found that this tendency was directly linked to an individual's feeling of a lack of social cohesion or shared values. They claim it demonstrates that people subscribing to the view that others have conspired might be more inclined towards unethical actions. People believing in conspiracy theories are more likely to be accepting of everyday crime, in turn predicting increased future everyday criminal intentions. In other words, getting back at the man. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 